Good evening. Welcome to the board meeting for March 23rd, 2021, the special meeting to conduct interviews of prospective candidates and to elect a new school board member. This evening, the special meeting is to interview and elect a new school board member and to transact any other business that comes before the board. This meeting shall come to order. Roll call, please, Mr. Rogers. Mr. Brown, would you like to start with the pledge? Oh, I'm sorry. Two. Yep, let's start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I'm one screen too far. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic, which stands one nation under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. I think we can do roll call now. Sorry. Dr. Haig. I am present and can hear the proceedings. Mr. Desnoyers. I am present and can hear the proceedings. Mr. Warsavage. I am present and can hear the proceedings. Mr. Neal. I am present and can hear the proceedings. Mr. Fields. I am present and I can hear the proceedings. Mrs. Mitchell. I am present. Mrs. Curry. I am present. Mr. Brown. I am present. Thank you. The following motion shall be applicable for tonight's special board meeting and committee meetings. Policy 003 allows the board to suspend policies or parts of policies when appropriate. Therefore, due to the current ongoing crisis, I make the following motions to suspend language in two of the board's policies for this meeting and the following committee meetings. Policy 006.1, which regulates attendance at meetings via electronic communications, I move to suspend the language requiring board members to be present. Specifically, the language would be, a majority of board members shall be physically present at a board meeting when a board member attends through electronic communications. And policy 006, which governs other requirements of board meetings, I move the suspension of language requiring that those members of the public wishing to participate be present. Specifically, the language in the section titled public participation would remove the words that read present at a board meeting. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Thank you. All those opposed? Please signify by saying I oppose. Aye. Thank you. All those opposed, please signify by saying I oppose and state your name for the record. Anyone abstaining, please say I abstain and state your name for the record. The motion carries. Welcome, Deborah. Welcome to this process. I'd like to introduce the board members. I'll have each of them say hello to you. Uh, we have Three of us are present in the room and the rest are online, so I am Ed Brown. Hi, Deborah. I'm Gina Curry. Hi, Deborah. Rachel Mitchell. Neil, please introduce yourself. Hi, Deborah. This is Neil Desnoyers. Thank you for applying for the vacancy. Damien. Hi, Deborah. This is Damien War Savage. A pleasure to meet you this evening. David Neal. Good evening, Ms. Williams. This is uh, 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 David Neal, school board director. Thank you. Meredith Haig. Hi, Ms. Williams. Thank you so much for applying. It's nice to meet you. My name is Meredith Haig. Thank you. Don Fields. Hello, Ms. Williams. Uh, this is Don Fields. Uh, uh, thank you for having the Courage to apply and step up into this process. Thank you, everyone. And Dr. McGarry, would you like to sell? Ms. Williams, hello. Dan McGarry, Superintendent of Schools. Thank you for taking on uh, this interview this evening and for considering uh, becoming a member part of this team. Please feel free, Dr. McGarry, to introduce any other members of your team, please. Sure. Uh, we have our CFO, Craig Rogers, who's also the board secretary. Behind you is Dr. John Council, who often assumes that position in meetings. He thinks it gets him out of having to answer questions. He's uh, in charge of human resources and equity in the school district. Uh, 
over to your right shoulder, you have uh, Ms. Aranda Buford, Director of Communications. Um, Mr. Dietzler, who is working tonight in a different role, obviously is an administrator here in the school district. Ms. Cindy Anthony, who's here to take notes, is a secretary to uh, Craig Rogers. And Trevor is one of our technology guys in the school district. I think it's important that we get you to introduce everybody. Jason Taylor, behind the cameras, is one of our most cherished, prized individuals. He makes all the beautiful images come to life here in the school district. Directly across, you have Dr. Manfrey, who's been here for a very long time in the school district, director of secondary education, and then Mr. Salerno, who has uh, been here as well, an equal, almost an equal amount of time as our director of elementary education. Thank you, Dr. McGarry. So as you can see, we have one big happy family. So. <laughs> All right, now we'll talk about the explanation of the time commitment for board members. The applicant selected for the vacant board position will be fulfilling the unexpired term until the first Monday of December 2021. The time commitment includes monthly board meetings, like this one, generally falling on the second Tuesday of each month. Monthly committee meetings generally falling on the fourth Tuesday of each month for the following. The Education and People Services Committee, the Finance and Operations Committee, uh, Liaison Assignments, and school board professional development. And I think my colleagues would say other duties as assigned, so it's never quite that simple. Okay, so now we'll have an explanation of the procedures and the guidelines for tonight. The interview will begin with an opportunity for the applicant to make an opening statement that is up to three minutes long. During the interview, each board member will ask one question of the applicant. After the questions, there will be a period for the board members to ask clarifying or follow-up questions related solely to an applicant's previous responses. Public comment will take place prior to the vote. So the order of the interviews, uh, you're gonna be first and you're gonna be last. Uh, we will now begin the interview process. So I think we have all of um, Ms. Williams' credentials um, in board docs, correct? Okay, all of the board members have access to that. We will begin the interview questions. And let's see, who has the first question? Mr. Desnoyers, I believe you have the first question, sir. I do, but it, am I correct that uh, Ms. Williams has the opportunity oh, to yes. make an opening statement? Yes, yes. Please, please, I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Press the button where it says talk and it'll turn red and then you can let it go. There you go. Can you move that closer to you if you need to. Good evening and thank you for all the introductions. I think I've met most of you in the room already before, but thank you. So again, my name is Deborah Williams. Um, I've lived in Upper Darby School District um, for the last 21 years in Lansdowne. I have a son who currently attends Upper Darby um, High School as a senior, um, and it's been an honor to watch him learn and grow here in this school district um, as a parent from the kindergarten center where he had Mrs. DeSantis, all the way up until now where his only teacher is currently Ms. Banglian, who he absolutely adores. So I'm not going to bore you with all the details from my resume because, again, I think you can just see that on the screen. You have that in front of you. But I will tell you that I'm honored to sit here before all of you um, in this room here today. And for you to consider me for this position um, to serve in this community is also an honor, so thank you. Um, I'm sure I'll have a chance to delve a bit more into um, speaking about myself, my views on education, et cetera, this evening. But what I do want to tell you is that I truly do have a heart for students. I do enjoy speaking with parents, um, not just in this district, um, but in our community in general, especially those who are not from the US and who need assistance navigating the entry process into the school system and figuring out some of the challenges of using digital learning platforms. I believe in an equitable education for all students. All children, I believe, deserve to learn with excellent teaching um, and a safe environment with the best resources, so including curriculum and facilities. And I just want to be a part of that process. So thank you. Thank you very much for your statement. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mr. Desnoyers, thank you again 
for making sure we got our opening statement from Deborah in. Uh, the first question is yours, sir. Okay, thank you, President Brown. So, Ms. Williams, my question is as follows. Please give us a brief description of your background. I look forward to hearing that. Turn the mic on, Deborah, I'm sorry. You have my resume, but um, again, I do have some experience with nonprofit work, with finance work um, and education, and working with people from many different cultural and ethnic backgrounds, um, as I kind of alluded to there. But I'm just confident that those experiences will lend a hand with um, working as a school board director. So I do have some um, teaching experiences. I've taught in, as a substitute teacher, probably in, I think, nine of our elementary schools, just in Upper Darby School District. But I've subbed in probably eight of local school districts um, in Pennsylvania here. So that's just a little bit of my background. I've worked for 18 years in a nonprofit industry doing HR work um, and some program management work. So I hope that answers your question a little bit, but you can ask me any follow-up questions you need to about that. Thank you very much for your response. You're welcome. At this, at this time, I don't have any follow-up questions. Thank you, Mr. Desnoyers. Dr. Haig, I think you have the second question. Thank you, President Brown. Uh, Ms. Williams, can you tell us why you would like to join the school board? Um, I can. <laughs> um, I think I want to join the school board to serve as a listening ear for our community and to just um, foster positive change. Um, I like a quote that uh, Bill Nye has. He says, everyone you meet, um, everyone that you ever meet knows something that you don't. And so I think I always um, carry that and remember that. So I think hopefully as you get to know me, if I have this opportunity to serve, You'll see that in some meetings, I'm not always the most vocal person at first. And I think that's because I spend more time listening first than speaking. Um, I consider myself to be a strategic thinker, an executor, a learner, someone that's pretty deliberate, focused, and disciplined. Um, I try to choose my words very carefully um, as not to offend, but I also like to get my point across and to be heard. And I think um, I'll fit as needed, but I hope to learn from others um, along the journey. So I think part of that um, could carry me pretty far as a board member. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Mrs. Mitchell, I think you have the third question. I'm gonna ask the question, but you already answered it in your introduction. But I just remember the first time I met you um, when, when I was volunteering at InterServe. And then I saw you a bunch of times around the district after that. So uh, how long have you been a resident? You can repeat it. It's fine. I've been a resident of this township for 21 years. Thank you so much for your response, Deborah. You're welcome. Thank you. Mr. Neal, I think you have the next question. Thank you, President Brown. Um, good evening again, Ms. Williams. Uh, my question for you tonight is um, how do you view your role as a school board member for the Upper Darby School District? Uh, Turn your mic. Yep. So I think maybe I alluded to this a little bit before, um, but I view my role, um, I think first and foremost, I'm a parent right now, um, foremost and so I think I'm going to be that first in how I view things um, as a community member, um, as a leader, as an advocate, um, and again as a listener. So I just I want to be a voice for people that don't have a voice um, and I also I like making policy um, so that's I think that's just part of my background and so I think um, again as a parent, a leader, an advocate, a thinker, so I just, I want to be part of a community of thinkers, of learners, and just executing things. So I think everyone has a role and everyone has a gift. 
and just how we use those gifts and how we can work together to get things done. I think that's how I see my role. Thank you, Ms. Williams. And as a side note, I, I love Bill Nye. Um, I, he is great. I, I used to watch him all the time growing up. Um, fascinating man. So I appreciate you bringing up and quoting him. I love him too. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Neal. Uh, Mr. Fields, I believe you have the next question, sir. Thank you, President Brown. Uh, Ms. Williams, it's a pleasure to meet you, even if it's virtually. Um, I, I look forward to, uh, in the future, meeting you in the person at some point. Um, our, the, our question here is, are you familiar with how our school district operates? I'm quite familiar with how the school district operates. Um, but are you asking that? Um, can you elaborate well, on that question just a little bit more? Well, I was told it was not a yes or no question, although I would accept yes or no. But um, uh, uh, if you just, I guess, who, uh, how do we expand on this question? Um, just um, the, talk about your friend goes to school. My son had uh, Ms. DeSantis as well. She what, is a great kindergarten teacher. I agree. Um, if you want to just talk about uh, your experience and your familiarity with working with the school district. How about we leave it at that? Okay, so I didn't know if you meant like hierarchical structure or uh, what you meant by that. Yeah. Um, yes. But if you're comfortable answering that, that's fine. Okay, I'm very familiar with school district structure. I work in one in an administration building. <laughs> <laughs> So there is a hierarchical structure, superintendent has a cabinet, usually curriculum falls under there, technology, business office, maintenance, uh, pupil services, HR, uh, however you, you know, many departments work under there, public safety, et cetera. And then of course the superintendent works alongside the board here. Yeah, but I've had a wonderful experience working with home and school, after prom, a bunch of other different committees um, in Upper Darby since my son's been in kindergarten and up until now. So I hope that answers your question. It, it does, thank you very much. Okay. Sorry for, uh, sorry it was less clear. <laughs> no problem. Thank you, Mr. Fields. Mr. War Savage, I believe the next question is yours, sir. Thank you, President Brown. And thank you once again, Ms. Williams, for, for joining us in this process. Um, you mentioned earlier that your son has a connection to Barb Benglian, and she is one of my personal heroes as well. Uh, so he's definitely in good company. Question I have for you this evening, and I know you touched on it already, was um, if you could give some more detail. What has been some of your more personal involvement with education in our community? Maybe one of the, some of the more memorable moments that you've had uh, involved in that. Memorable moments in education. Hmm. I think um, probably my volunteer experiences working in the district. Um, as I probably just mentioned a second ago, I have worked, um, I won't even say work because I think it's a service. And so I've served on home and school since my son has been in the district. Um, I've worked. Uh, district home and school, as well as home and schools um, from elementary school to Beverly Hills Middle School. Um, and again, I've done after prom. And I think it's been an honor to do um, the district home and school and do the parents as leaders with the diversity team, which is where I, I actually met um, Ms. Dawes. Um, so that was an honor to work and serve alongside her. So... I think that, that's been a memorable experience for me in education, um, but also um, teaching. Um, I'm finishing up a master's degree in curriculum and instruction now, um, and finishing up my teacher certification now to work into the classroom again. So I, I love working with students, um, elementary children especially, um, and I, I do have a heart for um, English language learners um, and I love working with students from um, immigrant backgrounds. 
So I hope that answers your question. If you want me to expound on that a little bit more, I can. Well, that was a perfect answer. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. War Savage. Vice President Kerry, I think you have the next question. Hi, Ms. Williams. So good to see you. What special, and I'm glad you're here, <laughs> what spe special attributes, talents, and abilities will you bring to the district and the school board? Um, I know you talked a lot about it in your bio, but I know there's some extras there. So if you could dig deep to, to let us know, um, what, what talents do you think you would bring to us? Yes, so I think um, I probably pointed out on my resume, I try to target some key skills um, that I think I bring, but I think interpersonal communication. Um, yeah, I think I'm a pretty focused um, person. I like to try to bring a group back together when I think they're kind of moving off task um, with something in a group setting. And again, I think one of my highest things, I'm a lifelong learner, so I, I like to learn from other people. Um, but also I'm a, an achiever, so I think those are kind of my top things. Um, and then just to get things done. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I think the final Jeopardy question um, belongs to me. Um, what do you feel is the number one challenge facing our schools today? Uh, this, one. this one's easy. <laughs> I think it's a lack of parent involvement. I think we could see real change in our um, school district with more parent involvement. I think it'll help boost student achievement and morale, and I think it helps tremendously in a classroom with um, behavior, discipline issues, and it could help teachers go a long way. So, I mean, I've talked to many people about this, and I know they think it's finances, but I do not. So, Interesting, interesting. We're unique yes. perspective. Most people automatically jump on finances. So I, I can understand you're, you're saying the parent involvement piece because I understand how you attack the parent as leaders workshop that I was uh, fortunate enough to serve with you. So I remember how important that was to you. So I understand that answer. Yes. Uh, I think that's all the questions we have. Do we have any follow-up questions from our board based on any of the answers you heard for any of the questions? President Brown, this is Neil Desnoyers, just confirming that I do not have any follow-up questions. Okay, thank you, sir. I appreciate that. He, yes. Ms. Williams, I just wanted to ask you, um, as, as you apply for this position, and you know some of us here on the board probably from your involvement, um, do you understand the, um, the detailed schedule <laughs> of, of being committed I know you you know you have other commitments do you know um, that sometimes when we there are things that arise in the district that need immediate attention um, and are you aware and ready to commit to that type of involvement I am aware our kind of um, saying at InterServe was flexibility is our middle name and so that has stuck with me. And um, so that's something I live by. And so when duty calls, you kind of have to fill in. And so I, I see my role, um, you know, on the board as service. And so not work. And so that's kind of how I always have seen my role, you know, work is service. Thank you for that answer. I, I really like that, you know, being a server. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that question, Vice President Kerry. Are there any other questions, clarifying questions from board members? I have a clarifying question, Mr. Brown, but I did want just for the public, if you could just skip back to um, the explanation of the process, just so the public knows when the position came vacant and the... Um, when we advertised it 
um, you know, especially since we only have one applicant tonight, I just want to make sure the public is aware that we did follow our process. Thank you. Okay. Um, did you want any other? Okay, you just wanted to state that. No, no, no. I, just, oh. I was hoping you would read um, what, what's written under number four, explanation of process. I certainly will. The vacancy of the school board director position occurred on March 6, 2021, as per policy 004, BOG 1, filing of the vacancy, the board has 30 days to fill the vacancy. The advertisement for the vacancy was placed in the Delaware County Times on March 10, 2021. The deadline for submissions for applicants was noon on March 19, 2021. And Mr. Rogers, I think uh, Ms. Williams was the only applicant to fulfill that. That's correct. Thank you very much. And thank you, Ms. Mitchell. Thank you for that. I think that was important for the public to hear. Director Warsavage has a question or a comment. Certainly. Mr. Warsavage, please. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Williams, uh, I just want to piggyback on uh, something that you shared with us earlier and also a connection to, again, Barb Benglin. Um, I'm sure that you've heard her saying of always raising that bar of excellence. And you did point out something rather interesting and what President Brown observed as a different way of looking at what the biggest challenge in your view was uh, to our school system today, which was parent involvement. My ultimate follow-up question would be, how would you, with your familiarity with also how a uh, school district is structured and you having been a parent here and so involved in your experience with a, even another school district, how would you specifically raise our bar of excellence? as a school district, as a school board, uh, in your unique way. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your comment um, and for your question, actually. I was actually reading, reviewing the comprehensive plan um, before I came here. So um, first, if I can make a comment, um, because I wanted to applaud the efforts of this board and Dr. McGarry on what has been accomplished over the last few years. And I've seen a diligent effort on um, one of those four pillars um, to cr increase the communication district-wide. Um, so first I want to give my hats off to Ms. Aranda Buford over there. And I just wanted to say that because I think it's rare for a day to go by where I don't see some form of district-wide communication that hits my Gmail account and or doesn't hit my voicemail and it comes directly to my phone while I'm sitting at my desk at work or something's pinging on my phone. So I think that has gone a long way um, to reach parents. And so I think more parents are apt to be involved um, in this district if they're hearing from the district. And so I just wanted to say that. Um, I, so I feel more informed than I have in years. And so I can also read about what's happening in our district um, on our website or on a Twitter account, and it's positive news, it's not negative news. And so I just wanted to thank you for that. So I think um, I can give you a nod for keeping parents informed about curriculum updates and things like that as well, because I think that's important. Um, so Mr. Worstavage, to answer your question, I think it's a positive step in the right direction. And so if you look back and you look at your objectives of what you set out to do over the last um, couple years from 2018 until the end of this um, school year, if you're reaching your goals and reaching your objectives and parents are looking at, okay, they're, set, they're doing what they set out to do, I think you can get more parents involved. So I hope that answers your question a little bit. Yes, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for the great clarifying questions, Vice President Curry, Mrs. Mitchell, and Mr. War Savage. Are there any others? Yes, Mr. President, um, David Neal. Um, please, I, please. Th this question's actually for Mr. Rogers. Um, I was just curious, were there any other applications received after the deadline? No, there were not. Okay, thank you. Okay, are there any other clarifying questions from the board? President Brown, I do not see any more questions from the board. Thank you, Ms. Buford. So I think we're going to conclude this portion um, of the interview. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Williams, for your um, diligent answers to all of the questions. And 
uh, thank you very much for um, being willing to be a part of this process. So I've been in your shoes and it's never easy to be held to this kind of scrutiny, but it is rewarding. Um, so thank you for at least willing to be a part of this process. So I think we're gonna um, adjourn this portion of the meeting. Yep. So we're gonna meeting, we're gonna meet, adjourn this portion of the meeting and then we'll be back in a few minutes. Meeting adjourned.
Welcome back. Thank you for your patience. We will now resume the meeting. Our first order of business for this portion of the meeting is the nomination and election of a new board member. I will entertain nominations. Mr. Brown, I have a nomination. I'd like to nominate Ms. Deborah Williams for the position of school director for the Upper Derby School Board. Thank you, Mrs. Mitchell. Is there second. a second? Don Fields, I second that. Thank you very much, Mr. Fields. I have a motion and a second. Are there any other nominations? Is there a motion to close nominations? I, I motion I'll to, motion to, to close to nominations. To this okay. is Gina. Thank you, Vice President Curry. Uh, do we have a second to close the nominations? Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second to close nominations. All those in favor of closing nominations signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please signify by saying I oppose and state your name for the record. Nominations are closed. Before we take a vote on the nominations, are there any questions or comments from the board? Uh, board President Brown, uh, I, I just, well, we haven't had a vote yet. So can I make a comment after the vote? After the vote, yes, or absolutely. Okay, thanks. Yep, sure, I'll come back to you. Uh, Ms. Buf are there any other comments or questions from the board? President Brown, I do not see any questions or comments from the board. Thank you very much, Ms. Buford. Uh, 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 actually, sorry. Mr. N uh, Director Des Noyers. I have a question for President Brown. President Brown, um, is it appropriate for um, public comment? I'm not sure how pub fits or doesn't fit into this meeting. The public comment is, is a part of this process, and that's coming next. Okay, sorry. No problem. Any other comments or questions from the board? Hearing none. Ms. Buford, are there any comments from the public? There are no comments from the public for this special voting meeting. Thank you. We will now vote for the position of director of the Upper Darby School Board. The nominee is Deborah Williams. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, please signify by saying I oppose and state your name for the record. Those abstaining, please signify by saying I abstain and state your name for the record. The motion carries Deborah Williams as a school board director. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I think I did say motion carried. Just want to make sure. The next order of business is to administer the oath of office to the elected board member Deborah Williams. Deborah Williams has been elected to fill the vacant school board director position on the Upper Darby School Board to serve a term which ends on the first Monday of December 2021. Ms. Williams, will you please come forward? Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of this Commonwealth. And the Constitution of this Commonwealth. And that I will discharge. And that I will discharge. The duties of my office. The duties of my office. With fidelity. With fidelity. Congratulations. Thank you are school you. Leader. Congratulations, Deborah. I think you have some order of business over here. I think you need to sign some paperwork. You have to sign the oath and have it notarized by Miss Anthony.
All done? That was fast. <laughs> okay, Mr. Fields, I think you had a, who was it Mr. Fields? Yes, Mr. Fields, I think yes. you had a comment or a question you wanted to ask after the vote. Yeah, just just a comment and, um, and some praise. Uh, thank you, Board President Brown. Uh, I just wanted to get on the record that um, Ms. Williams has uh, probably, probably one of the, the better resumes I've seen in applications to um, to serve on the school board. And she was our only applicant, yes. Um, we didn't, and there, there, was a, there was not anybody else to interview, that is correct. But um, she still interviewed and came prepared to answer questions, which I thought was great. And, and I definitely think that the work she's done in her life to this point um, given from her cover letter and from her resume supports uh, her being appointed to the school board. And, and, and I, I, for one, I, I'm very excited and happy to have her on the board. Um, I think uh, anybody can serve on the board. Um, those with a background in education have a shorter curve um, to, to serving effectively on the board. And, and uh, we have a number of people with backgrounds in education on this board, and I'm very happy to have another one on the board as well. And so again, congratulations, Ms. Williams. Uh, again, I, I look forward to meeting you in person, and I am I'm very happy to have you on the board. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Fields, for that. Any other questions or, or any other comments from the board? Director Disnoyers has a comment. Certainly. Yes, President Brown. Uh, Ms. Williams, I would just like to uh, thank you for volunteering to give of, of your time to serve on the board. I would like to congratulate you on your election to the board. And I also would like to say that I look forward to serving with you. Congratulations. Thank you. I look forward to serving with you as well. Thank you very much for that, Mr. Desnoyers. Any other comments from the board? Vice President Kerry. Ms. Williams, School Board Director Williams. It's really good to have you. Um, and I'm, I'm thankful that you um, stepped up and applied um, in, in the loss of Leah Dolls, as you mentioned, that she was our friend. And um, I look forward to working with you um, in fulfilling her legacy of the things that we were working on here. And um, I really appreciate time and commitment because this definitely is time and commitment. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's fulfilling to see the change that you talked about while you were answering the questions. And I've seen you do so much here in the district and be an involved parent. So I'm really happy to have you um, to work with us and I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you so much. I look forward to it as well. And I'll just echo some of that. I most um, are going to have the pleasure of getting to know you. I know you pretty well. We've I've had the pleasure of serving with you on a number of um, endeavors in the, in the um, district. So I'm excited about everybody getting to know you and see what I already know and understand what I already know. So congratulations, and I look forward to you being um, on our team. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do I hear a motion for adjournment? So moved. So moved. David Neal. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, meeting is adjourned. We're going to jump into the finance and operations in a few minutes. We're just going to give uh, Ms. Williams some time to get settled. Thanks.
Welcome back. Thank you for your patience. The Finance and Operations Committee virtual meeting for March 23rd, 2021 will please come to order. I will now turn over the Finance and Operations Committee meeting to co-chair Mr. Fields. Uh, thank you, Board President Brown. I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Fields. I, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. Got I got you. I just want to have Dr. McGarry talk you. about. I, got... yeah. I was going to throw it. Okay. Feel free. Go ahead. Uh, Dr. McGarry, if, if you could uh, go over how people can participate in the meeting, to how uh, watchers and, and, and residents can participate in the meeting today. Yes, as, as uh, Board President Brown indicated earlier this evening, we've made every effort to continue to engage with our public and make sure that while we're virtual, that the members of the, the residents of the community have an opportunity to ask questions or gain more insight into the decisions uh, before the board takes any action on any agenda item. And so if, there were, if you're new tonight, because we had a special voting meeting, these are committee meetings. Um, and so no action is officially taken this evening. The only action would be moving them forward to for consideration at an uh, upcoming board meeting. Prior to that, we allow for comments to come in or questions to come in from residents. And you can do that two ways. You can send in your comments to committee questions at upperdarbysd.org. Again, committee questions at uh, upperdarbysd.org or 610-789-7200, extension 2000. It's very important that you leave your name and your address and also important that you tell us the specific agenda item you'd like to comment on or ask a question of the administration or, or the board this evening. At that point in time, we'll do our best to answer your questions uh, before the board makes any decisions moving forward this evening. So Mr. Fields, if there's any need for me to update the public again, I certainly will. Very important that when you leave an email or phone in an information, please provide your name and address and the specific agenda item you're commenting on or questioning this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. McGarry. Uh, Mr. Rogers, I believe you have some math for us tonight. Could you please begin with an overview of your agenda items for this evening? Absolutely. Tonight we have one agenda item and we're going to discuss the, the possibility of a 2021 bond issuance, which I'll be asking the board to authorize administration to move forward with the process to start exploring a possible bond issuance in the year of 2021. And if you'd like, we can jump right into the presentation. Go, go right ahead. Thank you very much. So as I just stated, we're, this presentation is to discuss the opportunity of potentially issuing a bond in the calendar year 2021. So we're just going to quickly run through the reasoning behind the bond issuance, uh, the potential capital product projects that will be impacted by this. Uh, again, the historically low interest rates that we've been discussing over the past year or so, uh, and next steps. So first off, we'll run through just a couple of the uh, potential projects and each of these are subject to uh, change depending on the needs and availability of funds. So first, we have the Aronimic Elementary renovation, renovation and Addition, the Clifton Heights Middle School Project, the exploration and design of a potential new elementary school, uh, various summer projects that we've been doing over the past few summers. Uh, some examples are parking lots, roofing, and pointing of buildings. Uh, along with those summer projects, we've been uh, completing toilet renovations uh, in the fountain Following this summer, we would be looking at phase two of the Beverly Hills Middle School project. Phase one would be done this summer. Uh, and then also a potential elementary school having a bathroom project completed as well. And that's where we would need the funds or proceeds from a 2021 bond issuance. So the reason for bringing this conversation back up, not only because of the projects and needs for funds to complete those projects, as we issued the 2020 bond, we had experienced a, a historical low in interest rates, and we still see those interest rates at an all-time low. They're going up slightly. So this is actually a look back uh, for, for many years, uh, 34 years here, that you can see how low we are on the right-hand side in that red box. Uh, the interest rates have plummeted. Uh, this is uh, zoomed in a little bit. Uh, going back to 2019, so you know about a, a two-year look back. And you can see in that purple box, the left-hand side of that purple box is actually almost right on where the interest rate was when we issued 
the 2020 bond. Uh, and you can see a slight spike. And we're really looking at just basis points. So it's not huge. It's not, you know, multiple uh, interest points. It's really basis points, meaning fractions of a full interest uh, uh, portion. So uh, I will note these are 10-year averages. We've typically issued bonds on 20, 25-year uh, rates. So those those bonds similar to a mortgage, if you were to mortgage a 10-year mortgage versus 15 or a 30-year mortgage, the rates typically go up the longer you go out because the longer you have a debt issuance, uh, there's a little bit more risk associated with and, and the banks evaluate that risk and then offer a, a slightly higher interest rate. Um, so this is good news for us. Uh, I'd like to move rather, you know, a little bit quicker and try and take advantage of the low interest rates. They, like I said, in the past month or so, they've gone up slightly. Um, there's not enough data there to show the true trend of where they're going in the near future. Um, but in typical financing, uh, when you're at an all time low, there's typically only one way to really go up. And we've gotten pretty close to, you know, we're talking about sub 1% interest rates as an example by, you know, our recent bond refinancing, uh, where we're at 0.7%. Uh, so there's not really any direction to go, but up in this case, I'm hoping that they stay stable enough that we can take advantage again of a very low interest rate and, and make up for some of the lost funds that we didn't get to build into that full 2020 bond issuance. Um, so the next steps here are really create a feasible schedule with PFM and RBC who are our financial advisors. Um, you know, here are some of the mile markers. They're, they're not all here, uh, otherwise we'd have quite a, a long slide, but the main ones the Boyd board would be aware of is going through the process of the board approving a max parameters resolution, which would set the maximum amount of funds that we would issue in the bond. Uh, and prior to that, obviously, we would do our due diligence uh, as a district to make sure we are evaluating how much we need uh, in this bond issuance. Uh, next would be a Moody's rating agency interview where they have a call with myself um, and our finance team, and we discuss the financial outlook of the district, and then they come back and they offer us a credit opinion. After that, we would go through a pricing and rate lock and then settlement. And I know that in the past, I've always equated it to, you know, on a personal side, when you go through purchasing a home and going through the mortgage process, it's not far off. Uh, luckily, when you're purchasing a home, you're not being interviewed by Moody's. Um, but that would be similar to you getting your, uh, your FICA credit score read uh, back by your, your mortgage company. Uh, but those are the basic steps as we move forward. Um, so really tonight, I'm just asking that the board allow the district administration to move forward in this process, continue to do our due diligence and move towards that next mile marker of a max resolution, uh, max parameter resolution. And I'll take any questions from the board at this time. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Uh, I believe Dr. Haig has a question. Thank you, Mr. Fields. Yes, and thank you, Mr. Rogers, for a, another very clear presentation. Um, I wanted to ask about the recent federal stimulus funds. Um, we know a fair amount of money, or at least I understand a fair amount of money is coming our way, and I was wondering if you could say a little bit about how that is affecting our decision making in terms of the bonds and in terms of capital projects. So all ESSER funding aside, and I, I believe you're referring to the ESSER funding one, two, and phase three now, which uh, you know, has has become quite a substantial amount of mo one-time money, uh, we are going through our process of deciding how to best utilize those funds on what would be considered one-time costs. There aren't many that actually really exist that are one-time costs, but when we say that, we try to, we're trying to layer them into very long-term purchases. So. Uh, we first were evaluating the loss, the learning loss gap, um, and how can we use those funds to make up for that learning loss? That's the utmost of importance when you're discussing these funds, uh, because the funds are coming from the COVID uh, pandemic, um, and also causing the learning loss. So if the fund, those funds are meant to truly be used to close the learning gap. Uh, once we get beyond that and are satisfy where we think our needs are. Uh, we've now moved into other areas. Uh, and in that also, we were looking at curriculum and different uh, you know, creative ways to use the funds to, to improve the schools. 
Uh, on top of that, we've now, because of SR3, we're really starting to get to a point where uh, it's time we're going to be able to start looking at infrastructure. Uh, one of the major uh, portions of ESSER is to, to look at your air quality and COVID mitigation factors. Uh, so we do plan and we are in the process of evaluating, you know, our HVAC systems and see where the need is throughout the district, uh, you know, compile proposals, a plan, uh, and be able to bring that to the board in the near future uh, so that we can use those funds to improve the HVAC systems. And actually that folds into our multi-year capital improvement plan. So something that may have been a on the capital improvement plan to replace an HVAC system, say at the high school, uh, now what would have likely been part of this bond or a future bond, we can shift and start using those the, the ESSER funds to be able to uh, not have to issue the debt on that. But that also gives the district the flexibility to focus on the building projects that we have been pushing forward uh, in this process. Thanks, Roger. Thank, thank you, Dr. Haig. Um, before I get to Mr. Desnoyers, I think Dr. McGarry has a comment. Yeah, that's okay, Don. I'll go. I'll go away after Neil and uh, David if they haven't commented. Okay. Yet. I'll go after them and then I'll I'll, I'll wait. All right, great. Uh, Mr. Desnoyers, you're next. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rogers. You you um, you listed uh, you know a few projects that uh, are likely to be funded with um, any bond issuance. I just wanted to confirm that um, you know the work that the board will authorize you to move forward uh, with will um, result in um, a, a more um, detailed uh, will result in more detailed information from the board as far as um, an idea how much these various projects uh, may cost and therefore justify the uh, the bond issuance you request the amount of bond issuance you request. Yeah, so when we get to that point, you would absolutely be made aware of the budget and the items that would be included in said budget for the bond issue. And similar to the process that was completed for the 2020 bond, uh, just a note as well, you have to provide the rating agencies and the investors who would be secure or issuing the bond uh, how you're going to spend the money and there's requirements of how much has to be spent percentage wise within certain timelines. So, you, you know, part of this is our 2020 bond did not include the cost of the entire project of Aronimic. The reason for that was the appeal that was open on that project didn't give us enough certainty to issue a full amount of the project in that bond. So immediately when I say the Aronimic renovation in addition is included in this bond, it's to make up for the difference that wasn't justified in the last bond. If you recall, the 2020 bond uh, could have been a significantly higher bond issuance uh, and we had to draw back a little bit because at the time the uncertainty surrounding the appeal on Aronimic um, was not advisable to issue a bond for a project that, that was under appeal. Thank you very much, Mr. Rogers. Uh, I am, uh, I personally am very glad the, uh, the appeal on the Aronimic project is behind us and that project can move forward. Thank you, Director Desnoyers. Um, School Board Director Neal, do you have a question or comment? Yes, uh, thank you, Chairman Fields. Um, my, my question, uh, uh, Mr. Rogers, is I, I know you typically will present a more thorough uh, uh, explanation of all the finances regarding that. And I was wondering if you could include uh, the previous bond issuances of uh, 2020 um, what the max parameter was, and then how much we ended up actually um, taking out. Um, if that just could be included with that presentation at a later date. So I believe that was included in the October 20... Was it? Okay. Uh, I want to say it was the 23rd uh, committee meeting. But off the top of my head, the max parameters was somewhere around $38 million, and we issued a bond for around $26 million. Uh, with the par that was involved there, we ended up uh, receiving cash at upwards of $30 million. Uh, but that had to do with the way that the bond was structured. 
so we were, I think when we did the math, we were like eight to nine million dollars under the uh, max parameters. Um, but we can revisit uh, at any time. Yeah, yeah. Could you revisit just because in terms of um, tax increases, millage increases, um, you know, we usually go, okay, this is what the max would be, and then this is what the actual was. I think as we talk for the 2021 bond issuance, I think it would be important to reflect on the 2020. So as we move forward in that first step, the uh, max parameters resolution, we typically will have another committee meeting where we bring forward from PFM a breakdown of what we call the millage requirements study. I think that's what you're referring to, and it shows the impact of that bond on top of the already existing uh, debt issuance. Uh, so that would be the next step, you know, going forward, if the board were to, you know, give authorization tonight to move forward with this process, there will be a presentation discussing, you know, the, the impact uh, to the millage and as you've seen in the past, but this is the really the first step. So I, I, I think you're referring to what would be our next step. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Yeah, I think I'm just jumping the gun a little bit on that, but I, I appreciate all, all the work that you do in regards to the finances. It's it's a it's a monster of a project, and um, your effort is not unnoticed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Director Neal. Um, I, I want to say I do appreciate the effort into, and I'll get to Dr. McGarry in a second, but I do appreciate the effort into um, long term. Purchases for long-term items and not not uh, committing to recurring costs in in uh, and I'm speaking towards the grant money that will be coming in. I appreciate the efforts that uh, that the district takes in finding the best way and the the most effective way and uh, way to spend to spend this money. Uh, so I do appreciate that. Uh, Dr. McGarry has a comment. Yes, Craig Rogers, can you can you go to the, the slide that says potential capital projects? I think you know for me, I think it'll be important if we just again to David Neal's comment and to your explanation, your thorough explanation. Uh, if we go back in time, which I don't want to have revisionist history, we could have been in a different place. Um, there were questions historically over this team's desire to build uh, schools and do capital project improvements and what the cost would be to taxpayers. And Craig. Over time, you've really well explained that, you know, the pandemic has provided a lot of barriers to certain aspects, none more so than some of the community pushback to see these projects forward. And we're happy to be in a place now where we're moving forward. With that said, under, under your leadership, we had an opportunity and you went out and you, and you pushed us in a, in a conservative way to do our first bond issuance that came in at very low interest rates and at a considerable savings. The problem before us now is because that we were trying to initiate that with the most optimistic conversations, that we'd be in a place right now where Aronimic would be more than halfway in completion. And unfortunately, it was delayed by a considerable amount of time. At that same time, as a superintendent, I think it's important as a board, as a team, and Ms. Williams, on your first night, this is important for you as well, there are a lot of projects, a lot of plates that spin at the same time in Upper Darby. And we need to be aware of on this list, bullet point number three, we're starting a new process, which is the consideration of exploring a school on Carrington Field. That was not in the original bond issuance and the original conversation. So as board members, you know, through the borrowing and through the bond that, as, as Craig has explained historically, the bond issuance allows to cover some of those legal costs and the cost of exploring that potential site. That wasn't in the original bond issuance. So what Craig has presented tonight is, you know, we had that money for some of the work that we creatively try to continue to use with financially the legal fees involved in Clifton Heights that can be covering some of those fees, but also the potential for future projects. Uh, moving forward with the Beverly Hills Middle School project, uh, potentially Bywood Elementary School getting new bathroom projects. So uh, as we've said every year, we're going to continue to borrow at least $5 million in capital improvements above and beyond new construction. And what Craig has is, is explained here is in, in a very artful business manager way, he's saying, and, I, and just so you know, you're also asking me to look at building another new elementary school and other capital improvements, and that will require us to borrow money. And so we may want to consider the totality of these projects, lining them up in a timeline, uh, but also, as, as if, you can, if you can go a couple more slides ahead, uh, Craig, you know, Craig is also saying to us, 
historically low interest rates. You know, we don't know how long this is going to last. So one of the things we knew that we're now through an obstacle, which was some of the pushback on Aronomic, you know, some of these other projects, we hope that they do not pr provide the same barriers. And as a result, borrowing money at lower interest rate rates, maybe more money at lower interest rates, would be a benefit to the school district and capitalizing on that, like we could have and, sh and tried to when we had these other projects. I can't imagine how much money we would have saved if we could have capitalized on the Clifton Heights project and borrowing that money at the same exact time with these historically low interest rates. And it's important as a board, it's important as, as administrators, and with Ms. Buford, we continue to tell the public every day, every week, every month that goes by that we're fighting to build a new middle school in Clifton Heights, we're hurting kids and the potential cost savings of, issue, of building that school now. Thank you very much, Dr. McGarry. Uh, I I, I also want to, you, you mentioned, and I want to reiterate um, that, th as you said, there are legal fees and and we have to pay these legal fees for some of the fighting that's going on that is, in realistically, in the end, we're, we're going to build a school. And so I think there are plenty of members of the public that don't want us to borrow money to pay legal fees for what are essentially time-wasting legal maneuvers. So the the quicker we get the legal process completed, by which we mean the quicker the people decide to to just come to the table and you know dis discuss and complete these topics, the quicker we can stop borrowing money to pay for legal fees and we can start building. Right. So that that also should be noted as well. Um, let's see here. I don't think I have any more comments. So I'm going to ask Mr. Rogers to, oh, let me ask, uh, are there any, I'm going to ask, no, are there any uh, public comments? I'm sorry. And then we'll read the agenda. Director Fields, there are no public comments. Thank you very much. Mr. Rogers, will you review the agenda items presented this evening? Sure. We had. One agenda item this evening uh, to review the potential issuing of 2021 bond issuance uh, that I would like to ask the board to move forward so that we can continue our due diligence and move into the next phase of the, the process. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. I think asking to move it forward. Yeah, sounds good to me. I think asking to move it yeah, forward is uh, board, pres board President Brown's job. So I'm trying to throw it over to him. Yep. I th thanks, Mr. Fields. Are we, is everyone comfortable moving this forward? Yes. 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 OK, I think we have consensus, Mr. Fields. Fantastic. And I, I guess I, and then this is still this is still back over to you, uh, Board President Brown. OK, thank you, sir. Uh, a motion is in order for the adjournment of the Finance and Operations Committee meeting. So moved. So moved. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting adjourned. We're going to just take two minutes and let um, all board members log into the um, Education and People Service Committee meeting. So we'll be right back in two minutes.
Welcome back for part three. Um, the Education and Pupil Services Committee virtual meeting will please come to order. I will now turn over the Education and Pupil Services Committee agenda to co-chair Vice President Curry. Thank you, Board President Brown. Tonight for the Education and Pupil Services Committee, we have one agenda item. Um, I'm not sure who's running it. Is it Dr. May? Oh, Mr. Salerno, thank you so much. Can you go over the agenda item for this evening? Sure, thank you, Ms. Curry. This evening, we are going to present an adjusted PSSA testing window for students in grades three through eight based on guidance recently released by the Pennsylvania Department of Education earlier this month. We are going to have a two-part presentation. The first is going to center in on the adjustment to the school calendar as it relates to the Pennsylvania System of School Assessment or the PSSAs. And the second part is going to be a review of general testing information for parents and students in grades three to eight. Thank you, Mr. Salerno. You may begin. So we are at the exciting time of the school year where we have to um, start the process of getting prepared for the PSSAs. We um, actually just had our testing materials delivered to our buildings the last couple of days. Um, and one of the things that we need to decide, uh, that we needed to decide as a, uh, an administrative team is uh, the testing window. And as I just stated, updated guidance has been provided by PDE. Um, and the first part of our presentation this evening is going to require board action because it does include a calendar change. As you can see up here on this slide, we have a new proposed PSSA testing window for students in grades three through eight. Um, on our district calendar, our initial testing window um, was starting on April the 20th and running through the 29th of April. That was the previous testing window. And now we are looking to make a shift based on the updated guidance released from the Pennsylvania Department of Education. As you can see highlighted here on this section, um, we are going to be testing starting on the 3rd of May, and the testing window will run through May 11th. One of the other options that we did have to consider is the um, PDE did allow us the opportunity to uh, delay the testing window until the fall of 2021. Um, as a team, we are um, advising that we do not go in that direction. We feel that it is better to have the students tested uh, this year as opposed to students having to take the PSSA twice next year. So if, um, if you had a fifth grader, for example, uh, at one of our elementary schools and we decided to test in the fall, that student would then be a sixth grader at one of our secondary schools. We would have to send all the testing materials to that school and have that student take the test in the fall and ag again later in the spring of next school year. Um, so we are going to propose this calendar revision for this school year to be able to capture all the required testing between the dates again of May 3rd to May the 11th. I apologize, science would be May 3rd to May the 14th. So you can see there that May 3rd to May 11th include ELA and math. And for our fourth and eighth grade students, science would run from May 13th to May 14th. I'm also going to give some general information as we always do every year when we are um, about to take the state test. Just general testing information for parents and guardians. Um, the Pennsylvania Department of Education provides us with some very detailed information in the handbook for assessment coordinators that we are obligated to review and make sure that we train all of our teachers and staff on the expectations for administering the PSSAs every year. Um, in addition to that, there are some very clear um, expectations of our communications to the public regarding electronic devices and the test security. Test security is something that PDD, PDE expects us to take very seriously, um, and we always do every year. Uh, most importantly, uh, centered around electronic devices. Um, we need to make sure that we are going through the process of making sure that students do not have access to cell phones, smartwatches, iPods, um, any sort of electronic device that could um, impact the reliability of the test results and uh, in, in some cases also more importantly, 
impact the security of the test um, and the confidentiality of the test items. That being said, um, the students are going to need to have the test procedures and security certifications read to them every day prior to taking the test. Um, expectation is that students are going to uh, hand over any sort of unapproved electronic device prior to taking the test. Um, however, if a child is discovered having one of these devices, we then have to go through the process of doing an investigation, which could include potential school discipline, having the students retake the test, and notifying PDE of any testing irregularities, especially as it pertains to students with electronic devices that can capture an image of some of the testing items and compromise the test security. Our next slide here centers around the um, exemption from the state of test assessment. Um, and this relates to our district policy um, for excusal of an assessment if it's in conflict with religious beliefs. The only um, opportunity that families have to exclude their child from the PSSAs is again, if they are um, in conflict with religious beliefs and there is a process that we expect our parents and guardians to follow if this is the case. Our um, parents and guardians would not notify the school principal to schedule a meeting and follow the process, including um, signing a confidentiality agreement, which then gives us the ability to allow the families to review the state assessment in front of the district personnel. Uh, and then the families would have the opportunity to request permission in writing to the superintendent of schools, Dr. McGarry, requesting the exemption from the state assessments. And again, it had been made perfectly clear to us from the Pennsylvania Department of Education that this is still the only allowable exception to have a student opt out of the PSSAs if they are in grades three through eight. At this point, I'll take any questions from the board as it relates to the PSSAs, the testing window, and any of our expectations for uh, the administration of the test and test security. Thank you, Mr. Salerno. I appreciate that detailed um, explanation of what PDE has passed down for um, the school districts to put forward for the PSSA testing during a pandemic. I think um, Dr. Haig has a question. Thank you, Ms. Curry. Yes, um, and thank you, for Mr. Salerno, for the presentation. Mr. Salerno, what... Um, I'm assuming that even families that have chosen to remain virtual are still um, expected to send their students for testing. What is the impact both for individual families and individual students, but also the, the district as a whole, if we have large numbers of students not attend for tests? Yes, great question, Dr. Haig. Um, the state is still expecting us to make an effort to have all students tested in grades three through eight, whether or not they are virtual or in-person learners. Um, it is um, on us to make sure that we are encouraging all families and students to come in to participate in the state assessment. However, to your point, um, above and beyond the religious exemption, um, if families are virtual and make a decision not to have their child come in to participate, um, there is no issue with participation this year. Uh, since this is the uh, one area of, of the Every Student Succeeds Act, or ESSA, um, that has been waived with respect to state testing. So um, the silver lining in this is, um, while the religious exemption is the only allowable exemption through the eyes of PDE, um, there has been that, that, that waiver granted with respect to participation and that hurting us as a school district um, when it comes to that reporting out category. Thanks, Mr. Salerno. I thought I remembered that, but I wanted to have it clarified and, and also stated for the public. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Haig, for your question. Um, I think next board member is um, Mrs. Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. Salerno and Ms. Curry. Um, so the state is going to be tracking and putting the um, scores out publicly this year. Is that my understanding? Yes, that's correct. I believe that it is the intention of the state to put the information out and it will still be reported out our um, student achievement and 
growth data would still be reported out through the Future Ready PA index. Thank you. Ms. Curry, I don't know if maybe you want to talk about um, our advocacy day this um, this week, and um, Dr. McGarry, I think, is going to be getting some information on the timeline to Representative Zabel, but I, I know you really spoke during that part, so I'd love for you to talk about that, please. Sure. Thank you, uh, Ms. Mitchell. So um, part of my question um, tonight was going to be about um, for the public to understand and for parents to understand, because I in no way want to influence parents not to have their children test. But what this um, state testing assessment um, looks like um, for, our, for a district like ours, where students have not been able to um, go into the classroom um, due to our certain circumstances here in this district with space. Um, where some of our um, colleagues on other boards, we've talked about what Ms. Mitchell is referring to. We had our PSBA advocacy day where several of our school board members were able to attend virtually to talk to legislators. And one of the things that I was able to bring up when we talked to our state senators in the area was the fact uh, um, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Our children have um, lost a lot. Um, there are children who are extremely stressed, experiencing mental health um, concerns. And we know that on a regular year where everyone's healthy, that we really have to get students, um, you know, have great rallies and do the things to really encourage students to be able to test and to do well in these tests. My concern is this, the state of Pennsylvania um, is having assessments to assess where our children are but are they really considering our children? And so at this point, I um, called on the state senators to call for um, there to be a real consideration for our children right now during this pandemic and the inequities that lie deep within the school districts that have not been able to go to school and have children learn at the same rates that other school districts have. So at the end of the day, my concern is this. My concern is that the reporting, as Ms. Mitchell talked about and Ms. Dr. Hay talked about, is going to put Upper Darby School District and many of the school districts that lie in the southeastern part of Pennsylvania that are underfunded, um, at risk, um, at a weak point, and downright um, inequitable in the sense where our children don't have the same fight they don't have the same ability or um, not the ability that they can't test, but just, you know, they're not coming out with the same um, equitable opportunity to test the same during normally, <laughs> regularly, because of our situation in terms of underfunding. And now during a pandemic, it's despicable to me. Um, and I just want to say that we got on that phone with the state senators and with our representatives here in the area and share with them that there should be no testing this year. But I want to state clearly that I applaud this administration and the superintendent of Upper Darby School District for moving forward with what PDE has requested and required. But um, I'm appalled at the fact that, and I've stated it in all the meetings that I've attended, and I'm appalled that they're just not considering all of us. And it just screams about the inequities that are taking place right here in the state of Pennsylvania for students in areas that don't have the same opportunity. And so my question to you, Mr. Salerno, is um, with the reporting, what does it do for us? And I'm, again, to the public, I'm not trying to um, persuade you to not send your kids um, this is what the Pennsylvania Department of Education would like for us to do to assess our children, and we need assessments. But I would just um, ask us what we're feeling, you know, and what you're feeling, Mr. Salerno, about what the testing is going to show this year. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Curry. I think that um, first and foremost, I want to just thank the board for advocating on behalf of our students and families. I think that's tremendously important. And... Um, you know, we, we, Dr. McGarry has certainly been, been doing that all along and, and to have the board support um, to advocate on behalf of our students and families I think is, is incredibly important. 
um, as, as district administrators, we're put into a difficult situation because certainly we have to, um, the expectation is that we are promoting the idea that all students and families should be assessed. Um, and, and that is certainly, that, that is our, to your point, that is our goal, uh, to make sure that we're following what the information that we are receiving from the Pennsylvania Department of Education. I think it's important to note that while the information will be reported out on the Future Ready PA Index, um, we are in no way, and I'm thinking also not just about our students and families who are obviously most important in all of this, but also our, our teachers and our staff. Um, our teachers are, are not going to be evaluated based on uh, the test results, which I think is really important. Um, I agree with you that it's still, if it's public forward-facing information that is going to be on display um, for the PA Future Ready Index, um, you know, that, that's still of great concern. Um, but the teachers are not going to be evaluated based on the data and the district is not going to be evaluated based on this year's testing data. Um, so that, I think, in our conversations through the Curriculum and Instruction Office, that helps soften the blow a bit, knowing that, so we can have the students as best we can, to the greatest extent possible, participate in the state tests, and then use that information to make data-informed decisions around instruction, learning gaps, and getting a better sense of where we are. Um, but I do agree with you, uh, the amount of stress and pressure for our students and families, first and foremost, I have administrators, we have administrators, who have 40 to 50 boxes of PSSA materials that have been delivered in the last few days. In addition to everything else that they have been working so tremendously hard on, they are now tasked with, at this hour probably, labeling, inventorying, making sure they're going through the process of doing um, you know, a lot of work behind the scenes. It's not just about getting kids in and getting them in front of teachers to administer the test, socially distanced with masks and everything else that comes along with that. Um, it is also uh, a huge undertaking for, for our building level principals and their teams to be able to pull something like this off under the best of conditions. Um, so it's a, it's a big lift. Again, uh, we appreciate your acknowledgement of us putting our best foot forward with this, but in addition to everything else going on, it is certainly gonna put a strain on the entire organization, that's for sure. Thank you, Mr. Salerno. I think that's critically important for um, our parents and um, the public to hear um, that the teachers who are working extremely hard, um, that this is yet another task for them. And um, I do appreciate the teachers and staff um, here at Upper Darby for making that happen. Um, and thank you, Mr. Salerno. I think we have other questions from the board. Um, 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 school board member Fields, please. Thank you, Vice President Curry. Uh, Dr. Solano, uh, Mr. Solano, are testing days full days or half days of testing? I'm sorry, hey, Mr. Fields. Yes, yeah, you said the question was: Is the are the testing days full or half days? Was that the question? I'm sorry. Yes, sir. <clears throat> So that's, that's an excellent question. Right now, we are, we are working under our current schedule. So we have not made any schedule changes at the elementary or secondary level. So we're going to work with what's in front of us at this moment. At this moment, at the elementary level, we have uh, half-day programming. So we have a plan uh, to be able to administer the tests um, according to the schedule that's up here on the slide right now. Uh, that, would be, that would require us, under our current scheduling model, to test students in the morning. So to Ms. Carey's point, our teachers would have to administer the test twice. They would administer it to their AM cohort and then again to their PM cohort on all of the dates listed. So, that, so, so we would have to go through that process. We would have to distribute the testing materials, collect the testing materials, redistribute the testing materials, um, and, and we would have to go through that process. Dr. Manfrey and his team um, have a, a schedule that they have in mind, and I, I can let him speak to that specifically as it relates to the students in grades six through eight and what that would look like for them. Uh, I, Mr. I, Mr. I, Mr. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, here, here's currently my impression is that, so the kids in six through eight that are currently in building one day a week, they will lose three of the 10 to 11 days they have in school this year to testing, right? Because we got about 10 weeks left in the year, I would say, right? Uh, give or take. 
right now it's one day a week. We have we have the five co the five cohorts with uh, each cohort other than a particular cohort being in building one day a week. They would lose if there's three separate tests. They would lose three of those days that are supposed to be like in building education. Learning. Yeah, Mr. Yeah, Fields, I hate ahead. to cut you off, but at the middle school level, it's going to require us to uh, have a scheduling change. Uh, we are not going to be able to get the PSSA testing completed under the current model in a five cohort model. So we are going to have to go with the CDC recommendations of under six feet in the classrooms, uh, bring all students who uh, are in-person students, which we're still trying to work through. As you know, Dr. McGarry has put out to the public that they have the week of March 22nd to March 26th to decide if they're going to remain all virtual or come in. Our, our principals, our counselors, our assistant principals are working on gathering that information. And based on that information, we're going to have to come up with a plan for bringing our 6th through 8th graders in at less than 6 feet in order to accomplish this feat, and it will be a feat. Uh, if we do that, uh, in order to uh, not have an issue in the cafeteria, uh, these, this, this schedule will be a half-day schedule, but for all in-person cohorts. So I didn't mean to cut you off, but in order to, to get this accomplished, it would have to be that way. Otherwise, we would miss the window. Um, hold the phone. So, <laughs> so the CDC recommendations are, this is not on this administration. I, my frustration is with the state. Uh, this, as I'm sure everybody else's frustration is. The CDC recommendations uh, to less than six feet, that is if, um, rates are going down if rates are not very high or extremely high or high we currently here in the county are very high i don't know what we are in the township but and i know in the but people don't just live and work and breathe in the township they go throughout the county and all the other counties so so i know that recommendation that cdc recommendation is uh it's three feet for elementary school kids um three to six feet for uh, middle school and high school kids, if if infections are going down, um, so which is not currently the case in Delaware County, and so we have to we have to go ag against that recommendation. We have to do this because the state. That's what you're saying. We have to do this because the state wants these tests, even though it's not really recommended. At the moment, for us, I'm not going to debate whether it's okay or not, whether it's fine or not. The issue I have is that we have to make a decision, a calendar decision, um, because we are mandated to have these tests. When if we weren't mandated to have these tests, we probably wouldn't make this calendar decision. And on top of the fact that the days my son is in the school, and I'm, I'm obviously I made it very personal. Those are days that I want to be teaching days I, I I'm, I'm not sending him in so that he can take tests right and I assume too if we decided not to change the calendar these kids would have to take these PS I think what I heard is that these kids would have to take this PSSA next year as well so I guess I'm going to say for the record this is incredibly frustrating board member um, um, fields and, and just hold on a second and disappointing um, and I hope there's something we can do about it Sorry, board member Fields, I just want there to be a little bit of clarification because I think the last statement that you made, um, that needs to be clarified. Um, Dr. McGarry, please. So, Thank you. So, Don, you make a lot of valuable points. First, you know, I was going to comment earlier, but, but, but I'll jump in now. The, the, the training manual is 83 pages to begin. I mean, that's how ridiculous the tests have become. It's an 83-page manual that each administrator has to like have uh, verbatim down to how you're supposed to box the test up the right way. So Frank's right. It's it's ridiculous undertaking in this district when you have thousands of kids. The fact that we've been having a conversation about state testing is upsetting. It's more of a federal issue at this point than a state issue. The state 
I think is tried, at least in on an educational side. I do wish that some representatives knew fully well, and I, Ms. Curry did an excellent job with the other board members that were in the meeting trying to educate others on the situation, but I was a little taken aback that they were a little unsure at that point, Ms. Curry, I don't know if you agree, about what was going on, the totality of the testing. But I want to be clear. Right now, we are opting into this window for a couple of different reasons, because if we don't opt into this window, if you're an eighth grader right now, you would have to in the fall, if we did not do this window right now, take this test next fall, along with the test you would have to take in a Keystone-related course if you were a high school student. If we don't take this test right now and you're a seventh grader, next fall, you'd have to take your eighth grade tests and your seventh grade tests next fall. We are, tr we, again, to Ms. Curry's point, equity is lost on people, lost. There's this one size fits all and people think that they understand what relief means. Relief for Upper Darby has always been an issue and that's why Mrs. Buford and I went out in November to talk to people about, let's not get distracted. When in the midst of a pandemic, there's an opportunity to wake up and realize state testing is still here because in Upper Darby, we have to start st t testing in December because we're huge and because we're a block schedule. So it's even more of a monster responsibility in our high school because of the number of students and the number of students who have to take tests in November, again, potentially, or in December, in January, and again in the spring. Big, big issue. That means we'd have to test double the amount in the fall if we didn't try to fit in here. The other comment that's important that, that Greg uh, alluded to, the reason we have to consider going at less than six feet to take this test is because if we don't, to Mr. Fields, to your other comment, especially at the middle school, the middle school would literally be testing at six feet for an entire month. So we'd be bringing kids back in just to test. So what we are going to have to do is to make education still a focus and not spend a long time taking the test. The only other solution is to bring students in at three feet to shrink the number of testing days because at six feet, we'd be rotating kids in and that would require all the teachers to monitor the test and then the other students who weren't taking the test would be getting asynchronous work. They would have no direct instruction synchronously or in-person instructional opportunities. So we've had to brainstorm on top of everything else, how does that work in the cafeteria? Because there isn't still a lot of relief yet in the cafeteria. So the students would have to have a grab and go, breakfast program would continue. They'd strictly come in to take their test. But my recommendation to Greg and Dr. Manfrey and Mr. Salerno is, we have to capitalize at some point in time on the relaxing of the three and six feet. If we stay at six feet in state test, it's a month. If we try to come in at least test with masks on at our desk for three feet, we can shrink the number of days of testing at the middle school level. And so that's what this conversation is about. If we choose to not use this window, students have to double up on the test next year. In my opinion, that caters to school districts that are not like Upper Darby School District. There may be some school districts that can wait until next fall. They're smaller, less pressure, less stress, less of an issue. But given the size of our school district, it's not a reality. We can't turn around and tell kids to take double the test next fall, double the work on our administration, and then double the amount of days and think it's gonna be realistic. So yes, we are taking this test. I appreciate Ms. Curry, you acknowledging that this administration is really up against it. But once again, this is another colossal missed opportunity. There's plenty of ways to gather data and feedback on how well kids are doing out of this gap. We're in education. Of course we want to know. Of course this board's going to say to us, what's the gap? Close the gap. But we're chasing a testing module that's it's just lost. It's archaic. Why are we going to use this test right now when everybody knows there's a gap? Everybody knows there's been issues. So what's it going to prove? And to whose end and, and, and who's this, what is this meeting? right? Financially, where is this going? I, I always have this saying, follow some of this money. Who's involved in this testing game? And is that part of this conversation? Maybe that's a bigger conversation for a different day. But what's the rush to test during a pandemic, especially here right now? We're going to do the best that we can because our administration is awesome in this school district and our kids are tough and they do a lot of good things. But we're not going to have this be the final statement of, of who our kids are and who our school district is. But that's the reason for the three feet. If not, we'd be testing for a longer period of time. Thank Thanks. you, Dr. Thank McGarry. I, oh, I'm yeah. sorry. It's okay. I'm sorry. Um, 
Th thanks, thanks, Dr. McGarry. Um, and I, I wanted to also clarify, I wasn't proposing that we not change the calendar. Obviously, we have to, right? Um, otherwise, it becomes double the work and stuff like and and all the points that you made. I just was re bringing it up to kind of clarify to the public that that we are stuck having to do this. We're, we're all kind of stuck uh, have, having to do this until somebody higher up says that this isn't necessary. And so this is the situation we're in. Um, uh, uh, Vice President Curry, thanks, thanks for giving me the time to clarify and to, and to get on my little soapbox. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, school board member Fields. It's important that we do get our, um, our points out. So thank you very much. Um, board, uh, school board member, uh, Ms. Mitchell. Thank you. Just a follow up. I mean, it's, it's so concerning that at this point, when we're finally bringing kids back in person, we're not able to focus on, um, direct instruction at this time. So if there's any parents listening tonight, I'd really encourage you to reach out to representative Scanlon. I mean, she didn't make the decision, but she can advocate, on um, behalf of, of, of all children in the state of Pennsylvania um, to, to say this is not the time to do this. Right now it's the time to focus on the relationship building, the direct instruction, and, the, and our students' mental health. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Mitchell, and the, those points are, are very well taken. Um, and I believe uh, Board President uh, Brown had a comment. Yes, thank you, Vice President Kerry. Uh, I was in those advocacy meetings and I did listen to the legislators. Uh, so, but I do want to say that even though they were unsure, as Dr. McGarry had expressed concern about, uh, to their credit, I think they, they listened. No they, wa they wanted to get informed. And I think they are in agreement that our, uh, with our perspective on the concerns that we have about the testing, they did agree to advocate on our behalf to get yeah. relief from that. So I guess the proof is, will you know, time will tell if they really will actually make it, you know, if they listen to us and if it moves them to action, that's the important part. So that's it. Thank you, Board President Brown, for your comments. Um, and Mr. S are there any other comments from the board? Okay. It looks like everybody has gotten their comments out. Um, Mr. Salerno, back over to you. Thank you, Ms. Curry. So in summary, um, the administration is uh, presenting uh, an adjusted PSSA testing window, proposing a, a an adjusted PSSA testing window for students in grades three through eight, based on that guidance that was recently released by PDE. Uh, and we are looking for the board to consider moving that forward uh, for approval since it is a calendar change. The other information, again, was just general testing information for parents and guardians. Thank you. Um, are there any comments from the public? Ms. Buford, are there any comments from the public? Vice President Curry, there are no comments from the public. Okay, thank you very much. Just as a point of clarification, Mr. Salerno, um, on this vote for the board, um, if this is for the calendar, um, the agreement of, of the calendar or testing, um, if there are board members who are not in agreement with it, this would then... Um, kind of fly back on the administration to be able to figure out what they need to do, correct? I just need the clarification here. Right. I, so I think we, after our, our dialogue we just had, I think we just, um, again, processed through the fact that the state is still expecting us to administer the PSSAs. So that is still the expectation. We just have to decide if that's going to happen really this school year within the window that we are proposing that it happen, or if we potentially consider a different testing window, which would be the fall. Uh, but the expectation right now, at least, is that we are administering the PSSAs. Dr. McGarry, did you have something else? No, I think it's a, a great point that Board President Brown made earlier, too. You know, the representatives um, asked us to provide them information. My, my point to that was, it's too, it's, for them, it's too late. And, and to other board members' comments, it's really federal. I mean, our state representatives, there's very little they can do other than pass that on to the federal level. So our state reps really can't do much at this point. Uh, to Board President Brown uh, comment, they did ask to send them communication, we will. Uh, and to Ms. Gurry, your comment, um, really it would come down to, does the board want us to test now or in the fall? Your, our calendar this year was built for state testing this year. 
Um, they opened that window, if you recall, to make it a longer window. Um, and so now it becomes a decision whether or not that's something we want to do. And I think, yes, to answer you quickly, it would be a lot of double the amount of work. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. McGarry. I just want the public to know and the board members because a lot of us in this room and who are on virtually are not comfortable with the state testing. And so I don't want to vote in a, and put the administration in that position. And um, but I will, you know, make a statement before we vote that I am not in agreement with the state testing during the pandemic. I am not in agreement with it. And I understand that we have to vote on the calendar because it's something that the state is requiring. Um, but for the children that I serve here and the families that I serve here, I am not in agreement with the pandemic, with the testing during the um, pandemic. So I just want everybody to be clear on that. Your vote should speak to that. So in this process, in moving, moving forward, I think it would be the consideration of this and at the next board meeting before the board takes action on approving it because you know tonight is more of a conversation and consensus to move forward at that point the board would you know vote and make their comment whether they're in favor of that or not to your point and i, I want to make it clear we'll, we'll figure it out whatever we do we we don't want to necessarily <laughs> test during a pandemic either to make it clear it's just that there's no real relief for anybody in this situation. And ultimately, the kids are going to suffer no matter what we do. I think that's the stressor of all this, and the kids are the priority. But to, to clarify, and I know Kyle's on as well, but the board can simply make those comments, to your point, Ms. Curry, before the board takes action. So you do have some more time to digest that as well, to think about, okay, you know, what, what are we saying yes to? I understand your point. You, and at the next meeting, that would be a place to do that as well. Thank you, Dr. McGarry. So I believe that's it for the agenda items for this evening for education and pupil services. And I'm going to turn it back over to, um, and I just want to thank the board for all their comments. And again, to thank the administration, because this is a um, definitely a, a, a sore spot for me, but I know for other people um, who are working for the children here in Upper Darby and how hard we're working for the families and children here that the inequities just scream in this particular space and I feel like it's irresponsible again for us to have to have these tests during this time and I'll turn it back over to you board president brown thank you thank you vice president curry for facilitating that discussion that was a um, very engaging dialogue and I think it's important and necessary for the people that we serve thank you for that a motion is in order for the adjournment of the education and people services committee meeting so moved President uh, Brown, are we, did oh, we, yeah, we, we need to, you didn't, yeah, okay. Oh, I thought I was turning it back part. over to you. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so we need to move the agenda items forward for board action. And that's just the, um, the first part of the agenda, um, which is the PDE adjusted testing window that requires board action. So um, board members, are you okay with moving this forward for a vote at our next board meeting? Yes. 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 Okay, thank you very much. And the parent guardian information was informational. So thank you, Board President Brown, back over to you. All right, thank you very much, Vice President Kerry. Now a motion is in order for the adjournment of the Education and Pupil Services Committee meeting. So moved. Second. Thank you. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.